detail. Jay, I thank you for that warm speech. Fellow Toastmasters, Galen, Abraham, welcome, welcome to our club. How many of you know someone that was been sexually assaulted or raped? Looks like mo it's true for most of us. Isn't that a sad thing? It doesn't surprise me that most of us know somebody who's been sexually assaulted. Approximately 20% of women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And 3 to 9% of men will experience some form of unwanted sexual activity. In almost all the sexual assaults, over 95%, the perpetrator of sexual assault are men. And this is true despite the fact that most men are not violent. And most men only behave in sexually appropriate ways. Yet 95% of perpetrators are males. That is also true on college campuses. And, and sexual assault and rape on college campuses are particularly a difficult issue because there's so many young women and young folks there who are experimenting with a lot of different lifestyles, a lot of different things and it puts people at greater risk. We've got to find ways to prevent sexual assault. But when you think about 95% are men, we have to focus our efforts at preventing sexual assault on better understanding men and what can we, can we do to help prevent and reduce sexual assault in our, in our communities and on our camp, college campuses. Now when I talk about sexual assault and, and talk about masculinity, I have two fears. The first fear is I, I'm afraid because I'm going to be talking about men's socialization and what puts them at risk to committing sexual assault. And I fear that some people in the audience may think that I'm trying to justify men's behavior. And I'm definitely, that's not where I'm coming from. I don't want to justify men's behavior or, or, or excuse it. But I do know that if we're really going to prevent sexual assault, we need to really understand some of the underlying dynamics of the pressures that men grow up with so that we can do a better job of preventing sexual assault from occurring. The second thing, the other fear I have when I make these kind of presentations is that particularly men in the audience will feel like I am bashing them. And I don't want to do that. That is not my intent. I love men. I've been working with men uh, as my specialty area for the last 20 years to help men lead healthy lives. I'm a man myself. I have some insight into what it is to be a man. I don't like to be criticized. I don't like to be judged. And I don't like to be labeled or thought of as, as someone who's unsafe. But I also know if we are going to prevent sexual assault, we need everybody. But particularly, we need men's help, and particularly older men's help men who are older than college age, to serve as good role models to, to affect this, this type of change. Let's talk a little bit about how, what sexual assault looks like on a college campus. Now, for a lot of people, when we talk about rape or sexual assault, we think about some, some, some stranger jumping out of a bush uh, on some dark night and, and grabbing someone and, and raping them there. That does happen, but it's relatively rare. The way sexual assault and rape usually occur, particularly on a college campus, is by someone that is known by the survivor. You might think a little bit about what, you, what your conception of date rape might be. Uh, oftentimes on college campus, it's more done by someone that's known, a boyfriend, someone they're, they're dating, or someone they're at a party with. This is the type of situation where where rape or sexual assault is more likely to occur. Like I said before, 20% of all women will experience sexual assault sometime in their life, and 3 to 9% of men. This is not just for heterosexual relationships. People who are gay, people who are lesbian, people who are transgender are also at risk for sexual assault. In fact, they're relatively high risk. And this most often happens 
by, uh, again, by people that they know, friends or acquaintances or, or partners. But it also happens when pe for people who are committing hate crimes. So the sexual assault also occurs that, particularly for the gay, lesbian, and transgender population. Drugs and alcohol are a risk, a strong risk factor for sexual assault on college campuses. And approximately 50% of perpetrators and 50% of survivors were under the influence of drug or alcohol when the sexual assault occurred. So it's a really, a, a really heavy risk, risk factor. <clears throat> There's a woman named Mary Koss who did a fantastic research project in the late 90s. And she developed this questionnaire asking college men about what kind of sexual activity they had engaged in. And she gave this survey to thousands and thousands of college men throughout the nation. And what she found in this survey was basically that 70% of college men basically behave in sexually appropriate manners. In other words, they only has, either were not having sex at all or they were having sex with mutually consenting partners, which is what, you know, obviously it should, should be. So 70% were behaving appropriately. 20% admitted to engaging in some type of emotional manipulation to have sex. So for example, a boyfriend telling his, his female partner, if you don't have sex with me, I will find somebody who will. In other words, kind of emotionally manipulating or twisting one's arm. And 10% of college men admitted to behavior that would be classified as either sexual assault or rape. So, that's both good news and bad news. The, the way I perceive this uh, is that, and, it, and this is my perception, I know two things. After working on the university campus for over 20 years, I learned two things about college men. First, number one, is that most college men want to have sex. And two, most college men do not want sexual assault to occur. And I know that for a fact, that I've talked to thousands and thousands of college men. But what we need, you know, so this gives me hope, because I also know that we, if, we, if we could talk to that 70% and get us to help us, and if we can get men my age, John Rocky's age, Tim's age, more involved with men on campus and with younger men, mentoring and doing role modeling, we can make an impact on sexual assault. Now, the other thing I want you to know about sexual assault on college campuses is it's actually part of a larger picture. And that larger picture is what I call the college men's health crisis. And because there's a number of behaviors that happen for college men, which are actually, and happen for men in general too, which is actually uh, pretty, pretty disturbing. But let me get this set up. There's a series of symptoms that we see on college campuses with, with men. And many of these men apply to men in the community as well. Number one is a failure to adopt health-promoting behavior. By this I mean failure to use uh, sunscreen, to put on seatbelts, to uh, uh, eat appropriately, uh, maintain a good diet, to exercise regularly, even though we, we picture college men as being very athletic. Many college men do not exercise at a, re a regular basis. And when they do, they might become a weekend warrior or something where they, where they don't do anything and then all of a sudden they're out there exercising uh, you know, over the weekend type thing. And that really, really becomes a problem, uh, not adapting to these self-promoting behaviors. Engaging in risk-taking behavior. And this is a common issue for, for, for many young men, is engaging in risk-taking behavior to, uh, to prove one's masculinity. And I give you a very simple but very tragic example. Five or six years ago, it was a spring, late spring, early summer morning on a, on a weekend. And the U of O football team, the guys got together and said, let's go float the river. Fantastic idea. So they all got their inner tubes, they ran up the McKenzie River, they got up on a, on a river tr uh, bridge trussel, and every one of them, one at a time, jumped in the water with their inner tubes. 
Twenty men jumped in the river and started floating down. The 21st was a young man who did not know how to swim. But think about this. If you're a man, if you're a young man, and 20 of your buddies, particularly on the football team, they jump in the river, you're not going to stand up and say, gee, I don't swim very well. I think I'll pass on this, on this trip today, or maybe I'll walk around and just kind of inch my way in. He didn't do that. He jumped in as well. He slipped through his inner tube. He went down to the bottom. He didn't come up. And the football team dove down, they grabbed his body, they came up, they provided resuscitation, they called 911, got him to the hospital, and he, but he died four or five years later. I mean, four or five hours later. This is, you know, death, what I call death by masculinity. It's death, it's, it was needless. It, need, it didn't need to happen. Many men, many young men, die in this kind of way. Um, Let's take a look at some other things. Uh, higher rates of drug and alcohol use. Men, college, particularly college men, are, are using more drugs and alcohol than their, than their women, the women, college women. Uh, more referrals to the conduct, to campus conduct offices. We did a straw poll, contacted conduct offices on university campuses throughout the nation, and they told us 70% of the serious conduct problems that happen on college campuses are committed by men. More involved with either risky sex, which would be like unprotected sex or having sex with partners they don't really know, uh, and also violent sexual behavior. And again, keep in mind, most college men only behave in sexually appropriate ways, but there's, there's also men out there who are, who are taking risks and also being violent with their sexuality. Uh, higher suicide rates. In the 15 to 25 year old age bracket, six out of seven of the suicides that occur are committed by young men. Six out of seven. While women make more attempts at suicide, men are more often to actually kill themselves. And this is true in all different age ranges. And it's really dramatic in that 15 to 25 age range. And it also again increases from 60 to 80 the men who are who are in that age range, again, become higher at risk for, for suicide. You think about this, the shootings that have occurred on, and, and the knifings that have occurred on college campuses. Almost all the perpetrators of those, of those crimes have been, have been young men. Yet, when, when there's a campus shooting, we do not talk about, gee, what's, what's going on with men today? What's going on with masculinity? Why are these men being violent? We first look at, at, at gun control, which is an important issue to, to consider. But nobody asks questions about why are we not looking at men who are the perpetrators? You know, what is it about masculinity that makes people more prone to be violent? <clears throat> Despite all these issues, the other thing we know about men is they're less likely to seek help. At the University of Oregon, 50% male, 50% female. Uh, Yet we know who comes into the college counseling center, three quarters of our clients are, are women. So we know that men are out there, they're really struggling with all these issues, but they're not coming in for help. And that's not just true of the University of Oregon, it's true throughout the nation. Why, are, why do these things happen? Well, I believe it's because of two things. One is the way we socialize and raise our young, young boys. And two, the peer pressure and the role of expectations that are put on men. And let's take a look at these two areas. Male socialization. You know, there's, most of us think that, that women are more emotionally expressive than men. But they've actually done studies of young babies, new, newborn babies, and they've actually found that newborn babies, boys are more emotionally expressive than girls. Can you believe that? But they've also done studies of the mothers of three-year-old toddlers. And these women, these mothers, told the, the interviewers that they had a harder time judging the mood or the mood state of their three-year-old boys than their three-year-old girls. So think about this. What happens in the male socialization process 
that creates, here you go from being a baby and being a free and emotionally expressive, being able to express those feelings, to three years later, at three years old, being so stoic and shut down that your own mother is scratching her head trying to figure <laughs> out what is it that, that my young, young boy is feeling. I mean, that tells you there's something going on there. There's something socialization that's happening that's really negatively impacting our young boys. Around three is another terrible thing that happens is we start shaming boys for dependency. If a boy is clinging to his mother, what do we do? Don't be a mama's boy. Don't be a mama's boy. Now what three, four, five, six-year-old boy doesn't need his mother? Let, 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 me, let me see one. And is there something wrong with that? But we start shaming boys from a very, very early age for being dependent on their mothers, which creates a situation where men prematurely have to separate from their mother. Now, in some societies, when, when men were always there in the family and always had plenty of time to do the kids, that was okay in some ways because the men were there to help bring them in and nurture them. But what happens in our society? Many fathers are either at, are absent for one reason or another. So we have boys separating from mothers with no place to go, essentially, to get that other, that other support. So this place, then we develop this uh, unrealistic uh, attitude uh, and ideas about what masculinity is. So think about, fast forward this to young men who are going on to college. So here we have young men who are, who are leaving their homes, leaving their parents, leaving their family, leaving their friends, and going to something totally new. And they're expected to make this transition without expressing any emotion and without asking for help from anybody. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. And that's what happens to a lot of college men. They, they really struggle with making that transition and engage in a lot of different activities. That, uh, that are not helpful to them or to, to our general society. So what can we do about this? Well, then, before that, let's talk a little bit about male, social, uh, male role expectations. In terms of sexuality, what are the pressures or expectations of college men? Well, I can tell you for, for, from their peers, it's college men ought to be having sex. They ought to be having a lot of sex. They ought to be having sex with, with multiple partners, they ought to be good at it. Which is a little difficult if you're not that experienced. Uh, you must always be ready to have sex. And of course this is about sexuality, not to release a sexual urge, but more about uh, being a man, proving that one's a man. There's a reluctance to check in with a sexual partner. Gee, are we on the same page? Are we heading in the same direction here? Do we want the same things? Uh, and these type of expectations do not explain all sexual assault, but they contribute to sexual assault occurring in our communities. So what can we do about all this? I mean, understanding men is really the key to prevention. The, what we need to do is to develop programming and opportunities for men that are congruent with the culture of masculinity. It does not create defensiveness, it creates openness. We need to create safe places for men to talk about dating, and about relationships, about sexuality, so they can, they, can, they can consider some of these things. We need to create a safe place. We need to enlist men's help. That 70% of men who, are, who behave in sexually appropriate ways, we need to have them become good bystanders. They can help intervene in sketchy situations in ways that are not risky to them, that can also can prevent sexual assault from occurring. We can provide healthy role models, and that's important for all of us to be able to do and provide for men. For, for, as far as specific strategies go, I don't have time to cover that today, but I will cover that in a future speech. Thank you very much.